Okay, thank you very much. So I have the honor of kicking us off for the Synapse Deep Dive. So this will be a raster talk of many different uh, contributors. And what I'm gonna do is basically parrot a lot of the things that Gil Pratt just told you about. The example I'm gonna give you is automo automotive. So a fully instrumented car, meaning video, LIDAR, radar, uh, in-cabin cameras, uh, external cameras, will generate about a gigabyte of data every second that it's uh, running. Second example I'll give you is uh, the mobile space. So all of us probably have cell phones in our pockets. They're these, basically they're sensory devices. They've got cameras, usually two. They've got a microphone, they've got a gyroscope, many other different uh, sensors. And the model for these devices is they're currently operating as an interface into the cloud. So you've got all this sensory data, you've got a small processor on there, and it sends all that data to the cloud for analyzing and pushes the data back to you. So for instance, Siri will never work on your iPhone unless you have an internet connection, be it Wi-Fi or, uh, or 3G or 4G LTE, et cetera. Uh, and the reason for this is you're very power constrained on the device. You only got a battery. So you can't provide enough energy to do a lot of computation. Uh, so the technology will be telling you about uh, doesn't suck that much energy at all. In fact, True North can run, and somebody else will say this later, uh, at full bore for a full week on a cell phone battery. Uh, so it can be always on, and it can always be analyzing this sensory data. The final example I'll give you is uh, public safety. So we've been instrumenting our cities with cameras, and currently they're uh, just continuously taking video night and day, and they're storing it uh, in servers. And that data is usually only ever analyzed for forensics. After an event has happened, what happened in that event? Um, and again, I want to uh, highlight in all these examples that reaction time is key. So for public safety, within a few seconds, you want to be able to tell safety officers what happened, something interesting happened in this location. Please uh, respond appropriately. Uh, so the next thing I want to do is have one more video for you before we bring up the team. And this is a video uh, recorded by Larry Smarr. He is the founding director of the California Institute for uh, Telecommunications and Information. Uh, he's the uh, Harry Grubber Professor of Computer Science and Engineering at the University of California at San Diego. Um, and he's a pioneer in the field of information infrastructure, be it the web, be it the internet, uh, telepresence, and the instrument individual. So without further ado, I'd like you to, to see Larry's video. We're clearly coming to a crossroads where the von Neumann architecture as an end-all and be-all simply isn't going to work anymore. Essentially what's happened is every scientific instrument now has a computer inside of it, and that's on Moore's Law. If you think about the global change in the World Wide Web, in financial transactions that are happening all over the world, that's all data. Now what you want to do is to find patterns in that data. To deal with this pattern recognition problem, we've got to have new architectures that are really brain-inspired architectures rather than human engineered architectures. The human brain is somewhere between a petaflop where today's computers are and this exaflop we might have in 2020. When you look at the exaflop computer, it's going to need 50 to 100 megawatts of electricity to run, and yet my brain is running on tens of watts. Wow, that's a million to one more efficient. So it's been clear that we've got to learn how to capture this biological efficiency. One of the things we know from nature is that scale matters in brains. And so if you have a little fruit fly, it's got a brain. And it can do some pretty remarkable things like flying around and figuring out where to go. But if you scale up to say a dog or a cat, you realize it has a lot more capability of recognizing its environment, knowing who you are, interacting, behavior. So scale matters. And I think that we're gonna see the same thing when it comes to neuromorphic computers. And what's so exciting is the ability to finally get 
a really super scale in one processor, a million neurons and 256 million synapses in one True North processor. Now that's scaling. What we now need to do is work on two things, the software that enables those cores to be used in an efficient way, and more importantly, the applications. We've got to get our brains away from the many decades of von Neumann programming and really start fresh. So now I'm going to bring over uh, my colleague Rodrigo, who will tell you about the Synapse ecosystem and how we view the world. Hello, everyone. So in a joint collaboration across many IBM labs, um, starting here at Almaden, at Austin, at Yorktown, Japan, and Zurich, as well as with Rajit at Cornell University, we all poured our hearts and souls and our blood and sweat and tears into this project for uh, three years or so. And we built this amazing new chip. And we call it True North. And True North has one million neurons and 256 million synapses. So this is very big in terms of neural networks. It is made up by 5.4 billion transistors. This is the largest chip IBM has ever made. It works in real time. And this changes everything, because now a chip like this can take a stream of input data and pass it through a neural network of this massive scale in real time and produce an online output. And finally, it burns only 73 milliwatts of power, which means that if you were to connect the chip directly to an uh, iPhone battery, you could run the chip for, at full blast for one whole week. On the surface, true node is like any other system. You load a program into it, you present some input, and it will give you some output. But that is where the similarities end. Everything about True North is different. In order to build the chip that we wanted to dream about, we had to reinvent a completely new architecture. The chip itself is non boy Neumann. It's completely event-driven. There are no clocks. It is massively parallel. It is scalable at the core level. It's fault-tolerant. And the chip itself can tile. So one True North chip can talk to another True North chip, and so on. The programming model is also very different, because the chip doesn't run a program like a C code or a Java or anything like that. It actually executes a neural network. So we put a lot of effort into developing a whole of infrastructure here to produce these networks. And we have tools that allow us to prototype, compose, and eventually generate networks that get executed on the chip. We've created a lot of magic in this space to program the chip, but we also realized we were plowing through a whole new field in computer science. There's an enormous space for innovation here. The input to the chip is also very different. The chip takes spikes. As we saw earlier from Toby's um, presentation, spikes are little packets of data that are occurring in space and time and can represent many things. So we put also a lot of effort into encoding spikes and finding uh, transduction schemes. And if we're successful here, we're actually going to help Toby realize his dream of uh, spawning a new industry of devices that are going to be true north native. And finally, the output is also spikes. So we need new ways of dealing with those spikes, decoding them and transducing them into useful information. So the first big decision we made when we started building this chip was that it was going to be 100% digital and deterministic. Now, by being deterministic, it doesn't mean that it doesn't account for stochasticity. We put in a, random, a pseudo random number generator in every single core. And this allows us to create incredibly rich and dynamic and stochastic behaviors. But it also allows, by making it deterministic, it also allows us to create a counterpart and co-develop a simulator that essentially would be similar or mirror the behavior of True North. And we created Compass. We call the simulator Compass. And Compass, the first thing is extremely scalable. Using Compass, we um, ran on the Lawrence Livermore Sequoia supercomputer, and we achieved a result of simulating 10 to the 4th trillion synapses. This is enormous. This is the scale of a human cortex. And really, we ran out of supercomputer. If we had given us a bigger supercomputer, Compass would have scaled to that level, right? It does this by doing multiprocessor, multi-threaded, and multi-platform. We can also run it in Linux and other platforms. But the best thing about Compass is that it's equal to True North. And what this means is that at the system level, a user can just load a program, the exact same program, into either Compass or True North, present a set of spikes, and you'll get the exact same set of spikes on the output. To achieve this, we had to introduce a synchronization barrier. If you think about in the simulator land, you're running a program that runs through a for loop that computes or updates all the neurons. 
So on the chip, we did the same. We introduced a, a, a signal that synchronizes all the cores and all the neurons in the chip and tells it when it's time to step to the next step. We usually call this a tick. So you'll be hearing a lot about ticks in the next half hour or so. So um, building this, um, co-developing this simulator one-to-one -one allowed us to do three key things. The first one was that the software team could start developing algorithms while the hardware team was developing the, the, the hardware itself, so building the chip and, and doing all the infrastructure. The sec second thing was that it allows us to test the chip during the production phase, during the logic verification phase. We actually ran over 400,000 test vectors in the chip. And this resulted in getting the chip uh, back correctly on first silicon, which is a humongous achievement for hardware. And finally, what it allows us is also to compare what would it take to run a similar neural network on hardware versus on software. And the results are that the chip runs a thousand, a thousand times faster and also that it burns 400 times less energy. So those are very good uh, performance for moving the hardware. So finally, um, I'm gonna now pass on the microphone to David Berg, who will start going into the deep dive and tell you how we are using many techniques to encode input, um, transducer from video to spikes. Thanks, Rodrigo. So I'm gonna tell you about how you get your data onto the True North chip or uh, in the Compass simulator. So input is very important. True North only communicates in the language of spikes. That means that whatever the format of your data, be it audio, video, sonar, radar, hyperspectral, or whatever signal modality you're interested in, you're, for, you're first going to have to convert it into a spiking language. So earlier today, uh, Toby Delbrick showed you his amazing dynamic vision sensor. And if you have such a naturally spiking sensor, that's a very obvious uh, channel to communicate with True North. I'm going to tell you about some techniques that we've developed, uh, predominantly in the uh, visual domain, uh, that allow you to transduce uh, spikes into spikes, things like video from USB cameras, or maybe you're working with your favorite uh, classification data set and you want to load this up from disk on a traditional computer. Uh, so let's just go through a very simple example. Let's say you have this digit 8. This is from the MNIST uh, data set that many of you are probably familiar with. Uh, and we want to convert this into spikes. This is a process we call transduction. The first step in this process is to find an efficient retinal representation. Uh, this representation maintains the key aspects of your input signal, but removes some of the data. Uh, and then finally, convert this into a spiking representation over time. Uh, so let's go through a simple example. Uh, we have a retinal representation, which is a 16 by 16 grid of pixels. And each uh, pixel in this grid is represented by a floating point number. Uh, giving the, the basically the strength or intensity of, of the feature. Um, we can do something very simple for such a simple input signal, uh, which is simply to threshold it and convert it into a binary image uh, where we have zero for uh, no information and one for maximal information. And we can simply send uh, one spike uh, for every time you see a one uh, in this image. Um, real world examples, as you know, are usually a little bit more complicated. Uh, so in this example, our task is to uh, identify this tiger. Um, as you notice, there's a lot of pixels in the original image at the top, and we don't really need to send all of those pixels to True North. Uh, we can do something that's commonly used in computer vision, which is to extract uh, the edges of the image. So we maintain a lot of the important features, for, in for instance, the textures and the outline of the major elements of the image. And the final step here is to convert this into a spiking representation. So I'm showing you one very simple representation. Uh, each pixel in, in the edge image, the brightness corresponds to the strength of an edge. Uh, zero meaning no edge information, and bright white meaning the strongest edge. So we can simply send over some period of time, in this case 33 milliseconds, which is the standard duration of one video frame, a number of spikes proportional to the strength of the edge. Um, and the actual timing of the spikes doesn't matter because we're just going to count them or summate them on the other side. So to give you an idea of what this might look like if you saw the world as True North does, I'm showing you this video below. Each frame of this video is one millisecond of time, and each white dot is a spike. This is how the world would look if you were sitting on the True North sensor. Um, this may seem, I've, I've actually slowed this down about, uh, about a factor of 100 so that you can actually visualize it. And it may seem noisy. I mean, how would you recognize this image from anything? But if you simply integrate or count the number of spikes over a small window, you can simply reconstruct the original edge image that I sent. Um, OK, so those were just uh, some simple examples. This is an example from a real uh, vision system we've been building. 
Uh, this image in the upper left is from the DARPA NeoVision Challenge that Gil mentioned uh, earlier. This is a very hard task. It's to recognize 10 objects, 10 different classes of objects from a moving platform. Um, so for this one, we use the same type of edge extraction process for the retinal representation that I showed you in the previous slide, but we do so at three different spatial resolutions. And this captures different level of edge detail and captures uh, different sized objects where you have fine structures in my largest image there and coarser structures and outlines of larger objects in the smaller structure, in the smaller image. Um, and instead of sending a number of spikes proportional to the strength of the edge, uh, we use a different type of encoding strategy which is much more efficient. We only send a single spike to represent any particular edge value, but its place in time now encodes the edge strength. So for instance, if the onset of a video frame occurs at the zero millisecond uh, indicator, sending a spike very close to the onset of the frame may indicate a strong edge, and sending a spike later in time would indicate a weak edge. So we're not just limited to uh, simple representations like edges. Uh, we can create more con uh, complex representations representations and multi-channel representations. Uh, so this is an example of how we can ship color data onto the True North chip. Uh, in this example, we took our original input image in the upper left, and we applied uh, six different color filters. Each of these color filters is sensitive to one color in the center at a particular spatial location, and it likes it when a different color is uh, in the surround or nearby. This is a biological representation. You find this sort of signal processing in a lot of uh, biological retinal systems. <laughs> Um, in the image here, I'm just I'm showing you two filters on each image, and I'm color coding them by the preferred center color. Um, so what we actually ship off to True North here is 18 channels of information, but because it's relatively sparse, this doesn't uh, incur a lot of uh, power overhead. Um, so what I've tried to show you is that no matter what your data, uh, we have various signal processing techniques to create a retinal representation, and then we can use that rep retinal representation with several different encoding strategies to actually ship the data on to True North or to the Compass Simulator. So now that you've seen the inputs to uh, True North in the Compass Simulator, Brian Taube is going to actually give you some real-world applications, some vision systems that we've built using the inputs that I just showed you. Oh, thank you, David. Just to switch over. So now we see what's going into True North. Let's see what we can get out of it. Um, and to get a flavor for the kinds of problems we can solve with True North, let's look at a machine vision application based on DARPA's Tower NeoVision dataset, which is a collection of fixed camera, high definition videos shot from the top of Stanford's Hoover Tower. And the task is to locate and identify five classes of foreground objects as they pass through the scene. So cars, buses, people, trucks, bicyclists. And the challenge is to identify and detect every object in every frame in real time, which even humans can't do once there are more than a couple of objects to keep track of simultaneously. So that's the problem. Now let's look at two possible True North hardware solutions that are sitting over on this table. So first up is what we call the mezzanine board. Uh, that's this box right here. This is a test and evaluation system uh, that takes an off-the-shelf FPGA development kit and attaches a daughter board containing a single True North chip plus an FPGA to control it and transduce the spikes. And this is really all you need for a True North system. Data goes into the FPGA, which transduces it to input spikes. The True North chip tr generates output spikes, which the FPGA converts back into your favorite data format. The motherboard has two programmable ARM cores plus gigabit Ethernet, so you can talk to it. So for example, over here, we've got a case with five mezzanine cards uh, mounted vertically, and they're all streaming their spikes in real time uh, via Ethernet over a server, which we have tastefully hidden behind this curtain. Um, okay. So the True North chip itself is in the socket on the far right of the chip, of, the, of this board. I've tagged it here with the photo of the silicon die itself. And if we zoom in on this photo a bit, we can see a featureless orange rectangle. But the reason it's so uniform is that it really is a homogeneous sheet of 4,000 identical True North cores um, tiled in the 64 by 64 grid on the chip. Each core contains 256 neurons for a total of 1 million neurons on every True North chip. Each neuron has its own dedicated on-chip memory 
that lets it independently update and store its own local state. So here we have a chip with a million independent neurons. So our strategy for NeoVision is going to be to simply tile the entire input image with a grid of independent classifiers, each classifier looking at its own little piece of the territory up here. And just to get a sense for the three major components that we're running on the mezzanine board right now, we'll look at the territory a single True North chip can, can occupy. Let me move this mouse. Okay, so because this is, first of all, because this is a fixed camera application, the camera doesn't move, that means we can very precisely locate foreground objects simply by subtracting a learned background model. So the first thing we do is transduce the input image through a low resolution luminance channel that stream spikes to a True North program that takes up about 20% of the cores in the chip to say where it thinks foreground objects are. And so these are the white spikes on the middle right on the gray background. These are actually streaming live from that mezzanine board sitting upright over there. And you can see the white spikes track the objects as they pass through the image, but they don't tell you what exactly these objects are. So because the rest of the neurons in the chip can operate independently, we can have another transduction channel streaming high resolution edge spikes to a second True North program running in parallel that predicts what types of objects are passing through each grid classifier tile. So the green spikes correspond to a person, the magenta spikes are cyclists, and the bicyclist is just a special kind of person, so they get some green spikes too. And finally, we have a merge block that puts it all together, it combines the where and the what streams, in, and draws the final labeled bounding boxes. So this is what a single chip on a single mezzanine board can do. If you give me three chips on three mezzanine boards, I can cover three times the area. And maybe I'll target my boards at street corners or other regions with high traffic. But the beauty of the True North architecture is that not only do the cores tile within a chip, the chips themselves are tileable. So over here we have a 16 chip board, uh, 65,000 cores, and this really is a supercomputer on a desk. 16 million independent neurons, all with their own independently updatable state. And this board also has a couple of other nice upgrades over the mezzanine board, such as an x86 host and a fast PCI Express interface that lets us stream full resolution HD video to the board in real time. So now we've scaled up our population of neurons. We can just scale up our grid of classifier tiles. And the 16 chip board is now streaming its output directly to the screen up here. And we're covering almost the entire image. Um, I should say that when we train these classifiers, we only train them on the first half of each of these videos, and I'm only showing you the second half. So what you're seeing really is the out-of-sample performance. And of course, when you only see people and cyclists in your training set, some guy shows up out-of-sample on a skateboard. Um, but that brings up another point. Uh, what if you want to add another class, say for a skateboard? Here we've used 16 chips to tile the entire area. Do we have to add 16 more chips to get another couple classes? Or can we use our chips more effectively by thinking more carefully about how to program them? Uh, so let's go back for a minute to the single chip boards. In fact, let's go back to just a single chip. And here I'm gonna take a slight detour because Brian Jackson, our hardware team manager, doesn't actually believe that this hardware that his team built actually generates these spikes unless he sees someone unplug the hardware and break my demo. So here's Three chips, there's two chips, there's one chip. Okay, and actually we're down to zero chips because what I'm gonna show you next, unlike everything else I've shown you up to this point, um, is gonna be not streaming live from hardware right now, but pre-recorded output from our Compass simulator, which as Rodrigo mentioned, is one for one equivalent to the hardware itself. So this is looking at a subset of the NeoVision Heli data set, which is now 10 object classes to look for in moving camera videos shot at pretty high zoom from a helicopter flying over Los Angeles. And what I'm showing here is we've taken a, a model that fits into a single True North chip. And now, because we've embedded the True North architecture in it from the beginning, we can cover the entire uh, HD image and find a single class of objects, in this case, cars moving on interstate freeways. And the difference from the previous uh, model is that there we took an off-the-shelf uh, machine vision techniques and then mapped them to the True North architecture, whereas here it's baked in from the very beginning, and it's a much more efficient use of our hardware. 
And so you know, the cool thing about this is now I've got a single chip that can detect cars on freeways. You can imagine adding another chip that can detect cars other places, another chip for another class, and just scale up that way. So these are stepping stones on the way to the full Hilly data set, but also a single chip solution to find a car on a freeway is pretty interesting in its own right. So that's two hardware solutions using True North, examples of two different methodologies for building True North software. And now John Arthur will talk about the scalable, real-time, task-parallel architecture that makes all this possible. <laughs> 